Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 20th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcasts of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our final thoughts on the primary and the issues we see emerging for the general election. Second, our first thoughts on oil taxes, which we think will be an important topic this fall during the general election. And third, Senator Dan Sullivan argued that the federal tax cuts would pay for themselves. How's that going so far as some start to talk about doing it again in Tax Reform 2.0? And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Duke Show. Welcome back to the Michael Duke Show, your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking thought and discussion right here on Facebook Live around the world at Michael Duke Show. Dot com. I'm about to get scolded. I know I'm about to get scolded because I forgot to push one of the other buttons. We're getting into the flow. We're getting into the flow. But that's okay because I got my guest. My guest is here. He's ready to go. And we're about to have uh, we're about to have some great discussions. Brad Keithley is joining me right now. Brad is a former oil and gas consultant uh, and attorney. He has since retired and now is the founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, which is a group dedicated to obviously helping Alaska into the future with the sustainability of their budgets, their finances, and where they are going. Uh, Brad Keithley joins us right now. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, Michael good, good morning. morning. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, doing great. great. How are you today? I cannot complain, my friend. It's uh, another beautiful day. It's election day, and as we were just saying, I think I'm just about done with the primary action. Well, I'm a I'm I'm a policy guy, right? I mean, I I like to get I like to uh, to to talk about policy issues, listen about policy issues, see the candidates develop their policy issues, sort of evaluate the policy issues. I think we were done with that phase of this campaign about a week ago, and since then it spiraled off into personal attacks and into, you know, political triangulation and and into all sorts of things that that frankly um, aren't really exciting to me. I know they're I know they're they're a part of the process, but I was ready for this this primary to be done about a week ago. So um, I'm I'm ready for election day to happen, people to make their choices and sort of move on to to where we go next uh, in the general election cycle. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was one of the things I was saying earlier. This is one of my favorite uh, segments on the show because we get a chance to kind of get down into the details. I get tired of the sound biting and trying to suss down complex issues into, uh, you know, into, you know, these little 148 character tweets and stuff like that. It just it bothers the hell out of me. So we're going to we're going to try and, and get down into the weeds. We're going to talk about your weekly top three. Every week you have three top issues that are think you think are important for Alaskans to uh, to find out about let's kick things off with your with your number one of your top three well this week I think I, and, and on a primary day I think it's appropriate to sort of assess where we are with the with the candidates on the primary uh, where the campaigns are uh, and and sort of where the issues the, the fiscal issues in particular but also the oil issues uh, have landed which candidates seem to have put forward the best plans uh, and sort of, you know, take a stopping point for a moment and assess that. Um, and and from, a, from the standpoint of starting with the governor's race, 
um, I think Mike Dunleavy, frankly, has done the best job of laying out um, uh, an approach that, that I think is fiscally, um, uh, as close to being fiscally sound uh, as we've got from all the all of the well all of the candidates in the Republican primary at least uh, right now, he's he's focused on the PFD, which you and I have, we have talked about on the show ad infinitum for for weeks and months and and, and, and probably going on years time. about how important it is to protect the PFD. That's that's sort of the core of Dunleavy Dunleavy's focus. It's not so much the core of of, of Treadwell's focus, and I think. That is protecting the PFD, maintaining the PFD in the 50-50 split that Governor Hammond originally envisioned, moving 50% of the of the proceeds um, uh, of the amounts taken from the earnings reserve into the private economy through the hands of Alaskans, uh, I think is critically important uh, and, and is backed up by the economic data we've seen. Uh, the, the, the economists told us two years ago now that cutting the PFD had the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy was by far the costliest to Alaska families. The the work that's been done since shows that that is the approach, the the, the taxing approach, taxing the PFD is the taxing approach that by far has the it lands the hardest on middle and lower income Alaskans, allows uh, the top 20 percent to skate by. So. I think that I think that the, the PFD is sort of the cornerstone of of getting the Alaska fiscal situation uh, back under control, and Dunleavy's the one who's who's centralized on that. Yeah, and I think he he focused on that. We talked to him a little bit yesterday. I was hosting a show in Anchorage, um, and uh, we we had a chance to talk with him, and we were focusing a little bit on that because he was really the one that came out early, often and hard about protecting. Uh, the PFD, not just protecting it, but enshrining it. And, uh, I mean, Treadwell from the very beginning was not ambivalent to it, but wasn't, um, he wasn't against it. He's, you know, he's, uh, you know, all things are kind of on the table. Uh, he changed his tune as the campaign progressed because I think he started to understand, uh, as, you know, some of the top income earners are, 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 I think, a little remiss on, is that the PFD is a huge component of a lot of Alaskans' income. And they truly do feel it is their money, not a government handout, which, again, seems to be the common uh, theme amongst a lot of, uh, of high-end uh, uh, politicians is that it's, it's government money. It's a handout. And so I think he had to slightly uh, change his, uh, his tone on that. Yeah, but you go back and look at the positions Commonwealth North, for example, has taken, and Meade touts his participation on Commonwealth North as part of his as part of his campaign resume. You go back and look at the positions Commonwealth North has taken on that, and they have they have consistently been in the camp. They and the Alaska Chamber and others that sort of represent the top twenty percent have consistently been in the mode of, well, we can give up the PFD. Uh, uh, and and slide that money, divert that money over to government uh, as sort of the third piggy bank, if you will. We started out with the statutory budget reserve. We drained that. Uh, this is since 2013. We've drained the statutory budget reserve. We've gone into the constitutional budget reserve that started out with 12 to $13 billion. We've taken that all the way down to about $2 billion, actually less than $2 billion. And now they're sort of viewing the PFD as the third piggy bank that will start diverting that money uh, over to uh, support government spending. Uh, and 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 this comes from, frankly, I think it comes from the mindset of the top 20 percent of we don't, you know, the PFD is sort of pocket change to us, sort of free money to us. Um, we don't really, you know, count on it that much. We sort of, you know, stick it in our investments somewhere uh, or use it to fund an extra vacation somehow. We don't really count on it that much, and so yeah, it's 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 free money. Um, but they don't look at uh, the economic analyses have, uh, but the, but they don't. The top 20% don't look at the 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 role the PFD plays to middle income and lower income Alaskans, where it constitutes a not insignificant part of their income, and where cutting it uh, really acts as a tax. Uh, on their income. It t- takes away money they otherwise would have, diverts it to government. Uh, and those tax percentages, uh, as you work through the middle income levels and into the lower income levels, the tax impact, that tax impact of cutting the PFD 
is pretty significant. And so they don't have the money to spend. They don't spend the money by put it, stuffing that money into investments or by taking an extra vacation. They spend that money on on living, on you know, paying for heating fuel, paying for you know things, paying off credit cards, where they, which they've used over the year to year to to, to buy uh, to buy things from local Alaska stores. And, and so when you cut that PFD back, it has the impact that ICERS talked about. It has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy because they don't have that money to spend. That money's been pushed to government for government to make the decisions about how to spend the money. And it has the biggest impact uh, is by far the costliest to Alaska families. Right. I, I mean, the top 20 percent hasn't, hasn't, the top 20 just hasn't, just hasn't seen, seen that. that. Right. And, I mean, even Vox has recognized, uh, there was a piece on Vox uh, earlier this week that talked about, they even they recognize that this is a tax. I mean, this is not just a taking. This is a flat-out tax. Let's wrap up this number one here. Dud Levy, obviously, Dan Sullivan had this piece in the ADN. Uh, showing Dunleavy is the right choice. Uh, I mean, you want to put, you want to do some predicting here. I mean, I think he's resonating more with average Alaskans, uh, in part because again, there is kind of that drain the swamp, no more business as usual kind of mentality, and he seems to pity that, embody that less than Treadwell. But your final thoughts here on this uh, number one topic? Well, well I, I think, think I think Dunleavy is the right choice, and I and I think you know from what I've seen, I think he wins the primary. The the the, the challenge. Uh, I think the real action is going to be in the lieutenant governor's race. Who wins the lieutenant governor's race? That's not as important as who wins the governor's race. Um, I have a I have a dog in that fight because I I really uh, Kevin Meyer has voted wrong on every fiscal issue we've had uh, in the last five years. I don't think he's the right person to put in the lieutenant governor's spot, but a lot of people do, and we'll and we'll see how that. That comes out, but the PFD, as as people go to the polls today, if they want one final, you know, in golf you talk about it as a swing thought. If you want one final vote thought, it's what's the candidate's position on the PFD. That tells you sort of the core of the candidate. Do they believe in the private sector, keeping money in the private sector, or do they want more money in government? And if a candidate says he's willing to cut the PFD, uh, he's willing to take that money and put it into government. I think that's telling you they believe more in government than they do in the private sector, and I think that's the wrong direction for Alaska. So that would be the issue I would use to judge candidates uh, uh, if you haven't otherwise already made up your mind. During a subsequent break, Michael and I extended this conversation about the current campaign. Michael asked me to look beyond uh, the primary and look at what I saw uh, as the emerging issues in the governor's race as we come into the general campaign. Here's my response to that. Yeah, so I, I the, the campaign is evolving. Um, Mike uh, has recently started talking about his spending plan, his budget plan, and it's different. It's changed uh, over the course of the uh, of the last several weeks during the campaign. I mean, going into the campaign, he talked about the need for significant budget cuts, and while he was still in the Senate. He proposed roughly a billion dollars in budget cuts spread over uh, spread over a, a period of time to get it down to what um, uh, he's, he articulated, and I think correctly so, to be a long-term sustainable level. In the last few weeks, I've seen him start talking about a $4.3 billion budget uh, as a baseline uh, with a 2% increase uh, annually, in the oper- and that's just the operating budget, 2% increase annually. That's too high a number. We, we can't sustain that, even if you take 50% of the earnings um, uh, off of the off of the permanent fund and put them to government as Governor Hammond envisioned. And even with some oil price recovery, uh, and even with production staying flat, that's not producing enough revenues to support a 4.3 billion dollar budget with with a two uh, percent. Well, it's not not sufficient to support a 4.3 billion dollar budget. I think he's going to be vulnerable on that uh, as as Begich and Walker start uh, as we start having these three way debates uh, about about each other's plans. There, there are places certainly that Begich is vulnerable. There's be, certainly place, a huge number of places where Walker is vulnerable. But but Dunleavy is is I think walking into an into an issue here that I think he was very strong on when he talked about cuts. And in an effort, in an effort, I suppose not to have to talk about where those cuts would be, uh, he's sort of backing up into a position 
we're talking about a budget level that I don't think is sustainable on the numbers. So we're, we're going to we're, we're going to have some interesting we're going to have an interesting few months here as we go from the primary down to the general election as as the candidates flesh out uh, the policy positions that they've taken during the primary season. Well, and yesterday he uh, was on the show again with me in Stern's show yesterday. He did say four point one billion, um, but I know that you have said that really it's a sub four billion dollar number that's sustainable, three point eight, three point nine, somewhere in there. Um, that's really the sustainable number. But I guess my bigger question is: is he go? You know, is anybody else going to come up with a lower number of the three way race if he's if he's the winner in today's primary? Is anybody else going to come up with a lower number? No. no, but but the problem the, the problem that he walks into if if he has that higher number is all right that's not going to work on the revenues we got so what's your what's your new revenue source to be able to fill in that blank um, I mean I can run a spreadsheet and show that it's not sustainable at four point at, he, in in the ADN interview he said four point three so that's why I started using that right but right it in it, in I, I can run a spreadsheet and show that that's not sustainable so. So, Mike, if that's what you're talking about, you're going to have to be talking about new revenues. Where are the new revenues going to going to come from? And and yeah, nobody's going to be talking about a lower number, but but because he's not talking about an even lower number, uh, he's sort of walking himself into it into into a into a situation that that's going to be difficult to deal with. Um, so, I, I'm I'm surprised he's done that. I, I understand the politics of why you do that. You don't want to have to talk about where the cuts are going to be, but boy, from a from a policy standpoint, from a a, a supportability standpoint, that's just not that's just not where I'd want to put myself if I were him. Brad Keithley is our guest, director for Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about his weekly top three. Uh, the second piece you want to talk a little bit about, Brad, is kind of. You know, what's going on with oil taxes this fall? What's going to be happening with production? What's going on around the world? How is Alaska going to be affected? Uh, and that's your, uh, that's your number two. It, it is. And, and I, think, I think we're going to hear about this during the general election campaign. There was an article yesterday in the Financial Times, major um, uh, 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 economic uh, newspaper, uh, that I read and others read often. The Financial Times had an article about uh, the North Sea production recovery uh, and the oil price bump, and started and, and and broached the issue of is it time to reassess oil taxes in the UK uh, because of the oil price recovery and because of the production bump, and went to, and went on to talk about the UK fiscal situation, which which looks a lot like Alaska's. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of revenues or spending outstripping revenues, and and started to address the issue of oil taxes. I think we're going to see the same thing come into this election cycle. Mike Dunleavy won't bring it in, but but Mark Begich will, um, and candidates, various candidates for Senate and House will start talking about oil taxes. And frankly, I think it's a subject uh, that has some uh, uh, appropriateness to be talking about it at this time. Not so much because of oil price increases, not so much because of production recovery, which is sort of what's starting it over in the UK. But here we've had a major change uh, in the federal corporate income tax rate. Governor Hammond's original vision for a lot, for how to deal with with oil revenues was a third of the companies, a third of the state, and a third of the federal government. And and while that's not currently how exactly how it plays out. The last time we reassessed taxes, the corporate tax rate, the, gover- the federal government's tax take, uh, was significantly higher than it is now under, the, uh, under the, the Tax Reform Act passed last December. And so that sort of – that federal government piece has receded and sort of freed it up. It's going to the companies now. Uh, and the question is whether Alaska should have some share, uh, whether Alaska taxes should be re- revisited uh, as a result of that change in federal income taxes. So I think there's a reason to look at uh, oil taxes again. Uh, and I think and I think we're going to see that push uh, come up uh, in the election campaign 
And we're going to see it come up internationally about the same time as well for other reasons. We're talking with Brad Keithley. Brad, hold the line for just a minute. We're going to be back with more. I think when we get back, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the effect of oil taxation on exploration and everything else. And then we can get into topic number three. You're listening to The Michael Duke Show. You're all for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking thought and discussion. Getting ready to pick things back up here with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad is a former oil and gas consultant. Uh, he's got uh, some insight into the, a lot of the things that were surrounding that. We were just talking about oil taxation. And uh, Brad, uh, before we went to break, I was talking a little bit. You were talking about how they were going to change oil taxes, or that was potentially what you saw coming up in the election cycle. Uh, and what does that do for the Alaskan economy overall? Because we've talked a little bit about that. The volatility of taxation can affect uh, certain things like, uh, you know, uh, the production and the exploration, et cetera, et cetera. Where are you at on this? Well, well if, if we, we go, go too, too far, far in oil taxes, taxes like, like we, we did, did with ACEs, ACEs in 2007, 2007, if we go too far in, in making oil tax changes, uh, we certainly could deter additional investment. Alaska right now looks like it has a very bright future in terms of potential oil production, potential oil development, that will take a bunch of money to be invested up here. Uh, they're, they're, before companies invest that money, they expect returns, uh, and the returns have to be competitive on a worldwide level. They have to; those returns that the that the companies who are investing the money are looking at have to be equal to or better than the returns they're looking at from taking that money and investing it elsewhere. That's the template. Uh, that, uh, that that the companies use for making investments, that's the template we ought to use at, use uh, in, in, in putting together oil taxes. Um, in, in 2007, when we did ACEs, we didn't pay any attention to that, frankly, I don't think. Uh, and as a consequence, we went way over the line in terms of, in terms of impairing the investment returns. And we saw the consequences of that from 2010 to 2014, a great era of oil investment worldwide, but Alaska's share of that investment kept declining against our historic level. So the template that it, as we talk about oil taxes, and as I said, as we get into this campaign, um, not only here, but I think globally, people are going to be talking about oil taxes, and that's going to carry back into Alaska. As we get into that discussion, the, 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 the principal thing we need to keep in mind, the, the, the one thought, the swing thought we need to keep in mind is ensuring that Alaska remains competitive for investment. As I said, the change in federal corporate income taxes, I think, opens, opens up the issue for reassessment should Alaska take a share of the, of the uh, benefits that, that were created uh, through the reduction in the federal take as a re result of the change in the federal corporate in income tax. But as we assess that, the thing we need to keep in, the thing we always have to have utmost in our mind is how would any changes affect our competitive posture? And frankly, that requires some independent looks. The companies will say, well, if you, if you mess with it at all, it will affect our competitive posture. Uh, but we need to assess that independently and, and take a look at it. That, that's going to be the key thing. Well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, the companies, again, are, are looking out for themselves and their shareholders. There's no surprise there. I don't hold it against them. But that's why we always need to have a second look from somebody else outside the whole bubble. And I think that's where we failed sometimes in this state is that we've t kind of taken, you know, different things kind of at, at face value or at their word. Um, where, you know, again, the, the companies are looking out for themselves and their shareholders. Who's looking out for Alaska's shareholders which are us you know the citizens and that's been the legislature and sometimes i think they've been i don't know a little too trusting a little too naive in some of the things that they've done uh or taken the wrong advice overall yeah i they, they they sort of swung back and forth between the two 2007 with aces they went too far they, they were they were too untrusting that of course is on the heels of the of the of the uh corrupt bastards club uh scandal so uh, you, you can understand why there was untrusting, but but we went too far, and now the question is, if when we look at it again, and we will be looking at it again, let's not let that get in our way. Let's look at it fairly and objectively. What is, what is what is Alaska's share that we can take without impairing uh, our attractiveness uh, for investment? 
Right, absolutely. Well, that's number two on your weekly top three, although Harold says here in the chat room, the PFD and oil taxes are hot-button issues, but the key is AGDC, and if it proceeds, the uneconomical LG project will be a major threat to Alaska's fiscal health. All the major producers are involved with Cutter and other economically viable global LNG projects, um, and Alaska's LNG has zero product uh, producer support. What do you say to that? Well, Alaska LNG does have producer support. BP has continued to be involved. Uh, they they stepped back from ownership, frankly, because that was a way of cutting costs. If the state owns uh, the LNG project, uh, then there is a lower tax uh, cost to the project than if the uh, investor-owned companies uh, are involved. So, frankly, that was one way of, of lowering costs. But BPs continue to be involved. The producers need to to be involved in this project. They probably need to be more involved than they are now, but simply the fact that they step back from ownership doesn't mean that they aren't involved. I know that BP has been con continually uh, uh, involved in discussions with the state. They've entered into an agreement with the state regarding sales. Uh, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't commit their gas if they didn't see this project as having some viability. So I don't think that's the right measure. The right measure is whether we can find a project that works. Uh, and I think the state needs to continue to work on that. Uh, let's move on to topic number three, which uh, is more of a national deal, but of course has major trickle down across the entire country in Alaska as well. Uh, let's talk for just a minute about your third big topic of the day, which is, of course, where are we going in the deficits and what's happening with the taxation in the U.S.? Yeah, so the, so the federal issue... Uh, that I'm keeping an eye on, one of the federal issues that we're keeping an eye on, relates to the tax cuts that were passed last December. Uh, and they were passed on the premise that, uh, like some people believe happened in the Reagan years, didn't really, but like some people believe happened in the Reagan years, tax cuts resulted in growth that generated new revenue that, that paid for uh, the so-called tax cuts. So the nation ended up off in terms of its deficit, had more revenue uh, in terms of its deficit uh, after the tax cut than before. That's the theory, and that's the theory, frankly, that a lot of legislators, a lot of senators and representatives articulated uh, at the time that uh, the tax cut was passed uh, back in December. We've taken a look at, uh, as, as, the, as we've gone on, we've taken a look at the, uh, at the revenues that are, that are being reported uh, uh, as a result of the tax cut, uh, and uh, you can see that corporate revenues uh, are down and individual re are down significantly as a result of the tax cut. Individual revenues, indi individual tax revenues are sort of holding uh, even, although there's even some question about that, because frankly, what you're getting in this year is a combination of revenue of, of taxes being paid for tax year uh, 2017, when the before the tax cuts took effect, there was economic growth that was occurring in 2017. Taxes were higher coming out of uh, tax revenues were higher at the tax rates that were in effect in 2017. But those <clears throat> taxes are being paid in 2018, so that's sort of distorting the data. But it's clear that uh, corporate revenues, corporate tax revenues, are down, uh, and and as I say. Individual tax revenues, tax revenues from individual taxpayers uh, are holding at best, holding even uh, and may also be slightly down once you clear out uh, the 2017 data. The big picture is, though, is adding on the impact of the spending bill that came behind the tax cuts, the spending bill that was passed in February and then and then finalized in March. Uh, we're down. The annual deficit that we have, the federal deficit, has grown by 20 percent uh, in this fiscal year. Grown. The deficit is up over uh, FY 2018 over FY 2017. The deficit is up by 20 percent. That's against projections that were made going into FY 2018 before we had the tax cuts and before we had the spending bill. <coughs> Excuse me, before we had the tax cuts and the spending bill, the projections that were made that the deficit would be down by 20 percent. So instead of being down as we projected, it's up the deficit, the federal deficit, the amount by which we're going out and having to borrow money 
uh, essentially from our kids in order to in order to pay current costs. The deficit is up by 20% uh, uh, as a result of the C- Congress's actions over this past year. I think that's significant as we as some advocate uh, looking at tax what's called uh, in D.C. Tax Reform 2.0, uh, which is the proposal by some, at least on the House side, to extend the individual tax cuts that were that were that, that were enacted on a temporary basis as part of the December tax bill, uh, and to make other additional reforms, both administratively and through legislation, uh, to reduce to reduce tax revenues to cut to cut taxes further. Uh, it would be nice to do that. Sure, everybody wants lower taxes, but we're doing it at the expense of bigger deficits. And really, all we're doing then, as a result of that, is kicking the costs of government, the current costs of government, down the road to our kids. We're, we're refusing to face up to it. This generation is refusing to face up to it, and through debt, kicking it down the road to our kids uh, uh, to deal with. And, and I, I think, think that's irresponsible. And I think it puts the nation, the nation at risk. Uh, and lower taxes is good. We're down to less than three minutes here. Uh, the, the lower taxes are good, Brad. But, you know, you have to connect that with lower spending. And instead, what we've done is we've increased spending with lower taxation, less revenues. Uh, I mean, I've seen some projections. Thomas Massey talked about it being a trillion dollar deficit, potentially two trillion in the first year, and then being a trillion dollar each year beyond that as the spending increases. It's just insane. Down to less than two minutes here. Give us your final thoughts on on this. Well, we have to, we have to cut spending. I, here, here's the problem. We have we have senators and representatives and Alaska's senators and Alaska's representative are among them that talk a good game about uh, spending cuts and we'll match up spending cuts to to tax cuts and we'll get it, we'll work ourselves out of this deficit, but they aren't voting the way they're talking. Um, uh, you know, Dan Sullivan was one of those who said last December that the tax cuts are going to pay for themselves. Well, they haven't. Uh, Lisa was one of those who said, I think the tax cuts are going to pay for themselves. Don Young certainly was on board with that. And, 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 and then they go and vote for, and in February, all three of them voted for increasing spending. Um, so we, we're not, our legislators, Alaska's legislators who play a key role on a national, at, at a national level are not matching their actions with their words. We as Alaskans need to be concerned about this. It's affecting things like, you know, it's, it's going to affect things like interest rates that we pay in home mortgages. It's affecting a lot of our daily lives. We in Alaskans need to start holding our delegations feet to the fire and say, if you're going to talk, talk this talk, then you need to walk it. Uh, and they're not yet. Brad Keithley is our guest. Thanks for coming in, Brad. Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him on Facebook, follow his blog, and all that other stuff. I mean, again, we have to get down into the weeds to talk about this stuff. A soundbite is not going to fix it. Brad, thanks so much for being part of it today. Michael, Michael as always, thanks, thanks for, for having, having me. me. The Michael Duke Show, your hope for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking thought and discussion. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukeShow.com. Brad, uh, thanks so much for coming on board. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, <laughs> any final thoughts here for the guests as we get ready to wrap up and uh, and head on out the door at this top of the hour here? Well, well I, I the federal issues, I mean, we always sort of take it third uh, on the show because – uh, because the state of the issues are more important and more immediate to people that listen. But, the, but believe me, the federal issues are becoming as important in our daily lives. We're starting to see interest rates inch up. They're going to continue to inch up uh, as we deal with the inflation that's starting to be caused by this deficit and other things that, that, that are happening at the federal level. That's going to affect mortgage rates. It's going to affect car loan rates. It's going to affect the cost of goods and services that are already high up here. Uh, we, the federal stuff we need to deal with, and the way we deal with it is we need to start holding our delegation's feet to the fire. Dan Sullivan, you said the tax cuts are going to pay for themselves. They haven't. You need to go back in and, and do something about that. Maybe cut, cut spending, but you have to do something about cutting spending. Same thing with Senator Murkowski, and the same thing with Congressman Young. It's not good enough just to laugh and say, yeah, we'll get around to it. 
You need to do it. And if you don't do it, we shouldn't be cutting taxes anymore. And in fact, we need to be looking at, at raising taxes again to, to, to pay for the spending. So it, it's, it's an issue we, we, we don't dwell on every week, but is, it is an issue that's every much as important to our daily lives as anything else. And, and people that listen to this program, constituents, need to be talking about it with their federal representatives. Well, one of the things that the article in The Hill pointed out was what happens when we are spending a trillion dollars a year just on paying the debt? I mean, what you know, what happens yep, yep. then to the economy when it's a trillion dollars a year just in debt payments and we're having revenue issues, whether through taxation or whatever else is going on? I mean, it, that it, that money ball, eventually that money ball just is out of reach and you can't get caught up on it. Yeah, and it affects us. It affects us not only in our daily lives in terms of the interest rates, but in and in terms of the overhang on our kids. But it, it's going to affect us in terms of defense spending. I mean, you want to get want to get down the weeds. That trillion dollars in in interest that we're going to be paying is going to crowd out other spending. One of the one of the things that's going to crowd out is defense spending, and Alaska in particular uh, is a big beneficiary out of defense spending. With, uh, with with what goes on up in Fairbanks and what goes on uh, down in Anchorage. So it, it, it is it – is, <laughs> that increasing interest cost is hugely important to Alaska's economic future. Defense spending is going to be cut if we don't get that under control. Um, so it's, it's something, it's something that, that affects us. It's going to affect Alaskans in the pocketbook. It's not – it's not one of these things that's far off in D.C. and, yeah, yeah, we're in favor of cutting taxes and cutting spending, but if they don't do it, uh, so what? It is something that affects us. It's something that affects our day-to-day lives, our, the revenues that are coming into the state, and the, and the, and the spending and the costs that we have as, as, as living our lives. So it's something that Alaskans need to put on a fairly high level uh, when they're talking to their representatives and their senators, to their representative, representative and their senators. Brad Keithley, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, if you want to catch Brad this afternoon, he's going to be joining me on the Dave Steeran Show uh, in the uh, f- uh, 3 o'clock hour locally here. He's going to be uh, taking care of that with us. We're going to talk and get back down into the weeds. will be some repeats, but I'm sure there'll be some new stuff that comes up during that program. Brad, looking forward to talking to you this afternoon. Michael, Michael as, as am I. I. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me on, me on today. today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brad Keithley, Ooh. Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.